Oral history has always been a special interest of mine, and during my teaching career, I often sent students out to interview family, neighbors, and friends about the particular period we were studying. I was quite pleased in 1994 when the superintendent of schools forwarded a letter to me from a city councilor who suggested that the high school students be utilized to compile an oral history of Newburyport. Fortunately, I had a reservoir of interested students in my American history classes who agreed to do the interviews. Other students volunteered to transcribe the interviews. Bertha Woodman had compiled a history of the Jewish community in Haverhill and shared her expertise in interviewing our first group of candidates. Many of our interviewees chose to visit the students at the high school to be interviewed. Others were interviewed by the students in their homes. The first two volumes of our project that dealt with the Great Depression were favorably received by the community and encouraged us to continue the program. The tone of Volume 3, which covered World War II, was quite different from that of the first two volumes. It was, in many respects, more serious, and the sections were often longer. We deliberated for some time over this, for fear we would lose the interest of the reader. We decided not to change them. With graduation, a new group of students came on board to work on Volume 3. It has been 22 years since we finished our project. The two volumes on life in Newburyport that I published later contain many of these stories. As a child of the Depression and someone who vividly remembers what life was like on the home front during World War II, I felt that these stories deserved more attention. I knew that someday I would find a way to share them. Although we reached only a small number of those involved during World War II, we hope that the effort these students made will stand as an acknowledgement of all those from our community who served to ensure the freedom of our country. The Prelude, 1939. By 1939, it was obvious that Europe was preparing for another war. The Treaty of Versailles in 1919 that people had hoped would end all future wars was a failure. By 1939, dictators, notably Hitler, Mussolini and Stalin, were in control. The majority of the people of the United States, however, were determined to avoid involvement. It was a spring evening in 1939 when my mother and I headed for the high school to watch my sister, my only sibling, perform in a musical program. Jitterbugging was all the rage, and she and her friends were having a great time. What I remember most about the evening, however, was a song that they played, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree. I was only nine years old at the time, but I realized the significance of the words that puzzled me. Don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. No, no, no. Don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. Till I come marching home. I knew we were not at war, so why that song? Not until years later did I realize how appropriate that song would be. Meanwhile, war was coming to a head in Europe. On September 1, without warning, Hitler invaded Poland. Two days later, England and France declared on Germany. President Roosevelt, believing that the United States should help the Allies against Hitler, convinced Congress to change the Neutrality Act that would repeal the embargo on selling and shipping arms to the belligerents. The majority of the people, however, still favored neutrality. Winter came and went, and people in Newburyport relaxed, thinking everything would be all right. The Home Front, 1940. For six months, there was no fighting in Western Europe. Then, in April 1940, 
Hitler launched the Blitzkrieg, a stunning new kind of war that depended on air power. The idea was to strike with lightning speed. On April 9th, the Germans invaded Norway and Denmark. One month later, the Nazis stormed into the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, and from there into France. On June 19th, the Nazis marched into Paris. Thousands of weeping men and women lined the streets, helpless against this lightning invasion. In England, Winston Churchill became the new prime minister. Despite the determination of people in the United States to stay neutral, they cared deeply about what was happening in Europe. Many joined in tears when Paris fell, and they followed Britain's struggle to defeat the Germans. Britain was our closest ally. What happened to Britain would affect us as well. As often happens in war, music will play a large part in World War II in keeping the morale strong. The song, The White Cliffs of Dover, is one such song that won our hearts in 1940. In one of his most effective fireside chats over the radio, President Roosevelt alerted the nation. The Nazi masters have made it clear that they intend not only to dominate all life and thought in their own country, but also enslave the rest of the world. We cannot escape danger or the fear of danger by crawling into a bed and pulling the covers over our heads. No nation can appease the Nazis. No man can tame a tiger into a kitten by stroking it. Let not the defeatists tell us that it is too late. It will never be earlier. Still, there were those who believed they could ward off Nazi menace by the old-fashioned magic word, neutrality. The isolationists hoped the Neutrality Act of 1939 would keep us out of war. But Roosevelt saw during 1940 that if Great Britain was not to fall, it would have to receive more help from the United States. The question, could he convince the country in time? Gone with the Wind with Clark Gable and Vivian Leigh was playing at the Strand Theater. All seats reserved, matinee 75 cents, evening show $1.20. In September, the Newburyport High School football team beat Salem for the first time in 18 years. As an attraction to its patrons, the Premier Theater was advertising free modern art tulip hot oven dinnerware, which would later become known as the co collectible depression dinnerware. By 1940, New Report's population was 13,801, a decrease of 1,283 people in 10 years. The population of New Report had dropped to a level only slightly greater than the population in 1851. The country's first peacetime draft was established under President Roosevelt with the signing of the Selective Training and Service Act on September 16, 1940. The date, October 16, was set for registration, which would affect 16,500,000 men between the ages of 21 and 35, who had been made subject to a call to meet the threat of war. After registration, each man was assigned a number for military service, which would later be drawn in Washington, D.C. The first numbers were drawn on October 29, 1940, by Secretary of War Stimson, who was blindfolded and selected the first draft numbers from a goldfish bowl filled with capsules containing 9,000 separate numbers. The first new report man whose number was picked was number 158, Charles Francis Frost, followed by number 192, Aram Roosevelt Kalashin. 1941, the home front. President Roosevelt, having long recognized the Nazi menace, 
warned Congress that the nation should rearm. He tried every legal device to help the Allies secure supplies. In the November election, Roosevelt won a third term. Shortly after, he offered his Lend-Lease Plan, whereby the United States would lend or lease weapons, food, and equipment to Britain or any other country whose defense the president considered essential to the defense of the United States. Politics in your report was about to change. Bossy Gillis's ongoing fight to stay out of jail ended in April 1941 when Judge Fort sentenced him for criminal libel due to the content of his newspaper. Gillis was against the war, and as the country united to save the nation, he soon found himself on the outside and forgotten in the years that followed. New Report High School graduated its largest class in 1941. 201 boys and girls received diplomas. Rupert E. Nock was principal at the time. John P. Marquand's latest novel, H.M. Pullum, Esquire, barely escaped censorship when it was published in 1941. Critics charged that it cast a slur on the character and decency of Boston womanhood. Although the war had not yet reached the United States, shortages in many areas were causing hardships. In some cities, women were fighting for the last silk that came from Japan. Thursday, June 5, 1941, William Dickey. Orders are posted today, June 5, 1941, that I am being transferred to the USS West Virginia. I am the only one going to the West Virginia and I am delighted. I had received my choice. I immediately found out the West Virginia was stationed in Pearl Harbor. William Dickey, December 7, 1941. Sunday, the attack on Pearl Harbor. I awoke when Reveille sounded and lashed up my hammock stowed it away, washed and dressed, and immediately started setting up for breakfast in the E-Division living apartment. Breakfast was over and I had washed my dishes, but I had not taken them to the galley when the word was passed, away, fire and rescue party. I started to go up the ladder when the general alarm went off and they announced, general quarters, man your battle stations, and the bugler started playing general quarters. Just about the same time, and before the bugler finished general quarters, I felt the ship jar or shake. By now, I had turned and was running forward down the starboard side to get to my battle station. At the time, it came into my head that a ship was on fire out in the harbor, which is why they sounded, away, fire, and rescue party. And that had been, we had been hit as a result of an explosion on this ship that was on fire. We were being sent to the battle station in that part of the ship. The air compressor could not run. There was nothing we could do. About that time, we took another torpedo hit. The explosion threw me up against the starboard bulkhead. Getting up and finding that the ship, which had already been listing, was starting to list more heavily to port, I decided to hang onto the eye beam, running overhead, that would keep my footing. The next thing I was conscious of was that I was hanging up to the eye beam with one hand and crossing myself, like the Catholics do, with my other hand. We immediately took another torpedo hit, and I believe started to flood with fuel oil. The ship was listed quite steep now, 28 degrees, so I held on to the I-beam and worked my way back to the heavy wire screen cage that was built around the air compressor for safety purposes. I then went hand over hand along the wire cage until I got to the ladder going up the second deck. On the second deck, all the men seemed to be dead or unconscious. I went through the manhole in the hatch onto the main deck and started to run for the overhang of the number two turret. I was running alongside of George Reed, a ship fitter first class. A bomb hit on the centerline gun of the number two turret on the USS Tennessee. It was a shrapnel from this bomb that killed the West Virginia's captain, Captain Marvin Bennion. The shrapnel from this bomb also came across and hit Reed in the small of the back. We both got under the overhang of the turret where a corpsman took care of Reed. I have since learned that he died three days later. I stopped long enough to take off my shoes that were the same ones I had been issued in boot camp. I then went forward up to the bow of the ship. As I ran forward, I noticed that the USS Oklahoma had capsized, but that the USS Maryland was putting up some anti-aircraft fire. When I got all the way forward, I met Stu Jackson, whose brother William Clarence Jackson, a third-class electrician's mate, worked in the lighting shop with me. 
Stu was crying because a torpedo had gone into the steering engine room, and that was his brother's battle station. The water aft of us was all on fire, as the USS Arizona had exploded and blown up. He had figured his brother had been killed or burned to death. Everybody was diving headfirst over the side, as we had expected the ship to capsize. At that time, a cartoon that was printed in the Boy Scout handbook came to mind about never diving into unknown waters, and I jumped feet first over the side. I swam through the heavy oil in front of the USS Tennessee to Fort Island. William Dickey William Dickey had no way of knowing that a young man from Newport, Richard Patterson, lost his life aboard the USS Arizona when the ship blew up in front of Dickey's eyes at Pearl Harbor. Patterson was 21. He had, had enlisted in the Navy in 1941. He was the first man from Newport to lose his life fighting in World War II. The headline of the Daily, Newport Daily News on December 8, 1941 read, 3,000 casualties are caused by Jap bombs. Half of the numbers were fatalities. It was announced this day that one old U.S. battleship had capsized and one destroyed. The Army and Navy flying fields in the Pearl Harbor area were bombed, with the resulting destruction of several hangars and a large number of planes. It would be a long time before the country would learn the true story of the damage done at Pearl Harbor. James Afris. We had the radio on, and that is when they announced that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. When I went to high school the next morning, the freshmen were, as usual, sitting in the balcony, and on stage they had brought in a radio, and we listened to Franklin Roosevelt make his speech, asking Congress to declare war on Japan. That, of course, changed everybody's perspective. The people who were in the classes ahead of me immediately started thinking of joining the service. There was no talk of not going in. It was just expected that you would go. So the whole orientation changed, according to James Afris. Four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the government placed a ban on the sale of new automobile tires. That included truck, bus, or motorcycle, farm implement, or other type of tire or tube. By December 13th, an official notice by the U.S. Civilian Defense appeared in the local newspaper stating what to do in an air raid. The song, Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition, signified the realization that joining the war was inevitable. Darker days were ahead for the port city. Faith would become an important part of winning the war on the battlefield and on the home front. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition, and we'll all stay free. Shouting praise the Lord, we're on a mighty mission. All aboard, we ain't a going fishing. Praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition, and we'll all stay free. The Home Front in April 1942, the city announced that every person in Newburyport was to be registered for rationing purposes. In June, an order was received that headlights must be dimmed all over the city. Auto owners were required to either purchase lenses with upper half blacked out to use paint or some other material to achieve the same effect or to use their parking lights only. The Clipper Ship Restaurant, soon to be opened in Market Square, announced that its waitresses would wear sailor-type uniforms. This trend caught on as the war continued. Red, white, and blue was the popular combination, and women's attire reflected a military style. Joseph Doyle. When Pearl Harbor occurred, I was 22 years old and was working for the Coca-Cola Company in Providence, having left teaching for a lack of money. I decided that since there was a draft coming, I'd rather be in the Navy, so I joined the Navy. When I went to enlist at Causeway Street in Boston, I was intrigued by a recruiter who told me that because of my background as a teacher, I'd be a natural for the Navy because they needed people to teach yeomen. <laughs> a yeoman is the equivalent of a secretary or clerk. I said to myself, yes, now that's a job for me. All the time I was at sea, I never even saw a yeoman. 
After I'd gotten into the Navy, I was transferred to a training team at Princeton University as a probationary ensign. If you had a college education and had been working in a professional job, you were brought in as a probationary officer pending training. I went to Princeton for 90 days. They trained us Navy officers without ever showing us a ship or water, a very remarkable trick. After that, I was assigned to a force, which all of us had come to dread, called the Amphibious Forces. We knew what the Amphibious Forces were going to be. They were going to be ships that landed troops on enemy beaches, and nobody wanted them. My first dispute with the orders given to me was with a very famous personnel officer, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. I explained that I didn't know enough about engines to be an engineering officer, and he promptly made me an executive officer, the second in command of an LCI, which stands for Landing Craft Infantry. It was designed to carry a company of 200 infantrymen and land them on an empty beachhead. These ships were all manufactured in America. Nobody knew if they'd be able to sail the Atlantic Ocean because they had a flat bottom. They were 138 feet long and 18 feet wide. They drew five feet of water and nobody really knew whether or not they would be seaworthy going across the Atlantic. Mine was number eight. They built over 2,000 of them and we were on the first armada. We sailed out of Norfolk, Virginia to Bermuda. In Bermuda, we met the first instance of the tragedies of war, which is death. Our armada was anchored in the harbor, and one night when several of the men from our flotilla went ashore during a storm, the whaleboat we were using to go to shore capsized and we lost 12 men. We had to stay in Bermuda while waiting for replacements. Finally, we left for Gibraltar. It took us 28 days to go from Bermuda to Gibraltar. I lost 35 pounds in the crossing. We went from there to North Africa, starting with Algeria at a town called Arzu. Our job at the time was to occupy the towns as the American forces were starting to force the Germans back into North Africa. One of my more interesting experiences was in the town of Most Agenem in Algeria. I was chief of police at the time. I don't know why they did that. I knew nothing about the law. I didn't know that much French, and everybody in the town spoke French. I was definitely not a success. May 8, 1942, William Dickey. Our planes attacked the Shuktu and scored three hits. 20 minutes later, 70 Japanese planes attacked us. I am in the forward engine room running the main generator. Torpedo planes and dive bombers attacked. The Yorktown takes one bomb. We took some near misses and sustained a few shrapnel holes. The Lexington is hit by two bombs and two torpedoes. She continued for a while to steam at 27 knots until a gasoline explosion rocked her exterior. When we secured from the battle stations and general quarters in around 1500 hours, I went topside and looking over, I could only see smoke, once in a while coming from the Lexington. In the end, we had lost the oil tanker USS Nisho, the destroyer USS Sims, and the USS Lexington, but the Japanese had lost the use of two carriers and the Shuktu has been sunk. William Dickey. 1942. Comment Bob Fuller had this to say in his interview. I was a hobo in 1939 and I was in jail in Wyoming when Hitler invaded Poland. I told the prosecutor that if you let me out of jail, I'll go home and join the Marines. I got in the Marines for two reasons. One, to get out of jail and the other because it was something to do, something to do during the Depression. Despite this rather rough start, Bob had a long and highly decorated war record. For his bravery, he received the much-coveted Navy Cross. Well, I did my first year in Quantico, Virginia. Then right after Pearl Harbor, they called us for volunteer parachutists. They got paid an extra $50 a month as a parachutist. That appealed to me, so I volunteered for parachute training. They were making up the 1st Marine Division, and we became the first 
parachute battalion. We didn't have enough for a regiment. It takes three battalions to make a regiment. So that must have been around April or May 1942. We did little field training, and pretty soon we were on a train for the West Coast to get on the troop ships to go to New Zealand and up through the Fijis to the Solomon Islands. I went up with the 1st Parachute Battalion. George Duffy. After I graduated from nautical school, I received a license as a deck officer in the U.S. Merchant Marines. I went down to New York and found a job with a company called the United States Lines. And I went to sea as a deck officer. At 19 years of age, I was in charge of this ship from 8 o'clock in the morning until noontime and from 8 at night until midnight. That's the way it went. I made a trip out to the Far East to places like the Philippines, Australia, New Caledonia. During that trip, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and I found myself a long way from home. But we could go back. The ship was fitted with some guns. The German raider Mielke had a very successful summer in 1942. She came down from Europe and spent the summer zigzagging around the Atlantic Ocean and by September had sunk 10 ships. My ship, the American leader, was a brand new ship, a real classy vessel. She used twin diesel engines and in the dining room was chrome and leather. I was 19 years old. I had my own stateroom. I had a fellow to make up my bed in the morning and a waiter in the dining room. I'll tell you, I was on top of the world. But on the 10th of September, three days after leaving Cape Town, the Milke found us. It found us shortly after dark at about 10 minutes to eight at night. The Milke came down on this side of us, and when he saw us, of course his guns were all ready. As they came by, they destroyed two lifeboats and set the whole deck house on fire. They used a lot of tracers. We did have, at that point, five life rafts on the deck which we were able to launch. About two hours after the American leader sank, the Milke came back to the scene and picked up survivors. The captain didn't want us to be picked up by an allied ship because we would be able to tell them he was out there. He wanted to maintain his secrecy, so he picked us up and took us prisoner. Norman Doyle. I enlisted the day after Pearl Harbor. In 1942, I was in Iceland, and then we went further north to the Arctic Circle. We were there during the 22 hours of sunshine. It changes every six months, so we were also there for 24 hours of darkness. From up on deck at noontime, it's just like midnight and vice versa. At midnight, you'll come up and the sun will be shining. So that was very interesting. And there were huge icebergs. Of course, the North Atlantic is a terrible ocean. It's almost indescribable. If you're not careful, it will kill you, and it was a wild, wild, wild ocean. The waves are like they are in a hurricane. Ordinarily, the waves in the ocean are 20 to 25 feet high, but the swells in a hurricane are 50 to 60 feet high, and the icebergs are 10 stories high, and you had to be careful because what we saw was out of the water. The real danger was underneath the water. We had come to a dead stop when we hit heavy waters because of all the U-boats around. Obviously, they were having as much trouble as we were, but they could maneuver a little better than we could because they were under the water. The storm was so bad, it was ripping everything off the decks. Of course, our friends, the U-boats, were there all the time. They attacked several of the convoys we were escorting at that time. And we were constantly on battle stations on a lookout for U-boats and mines. They had mined the whole area. One night they got in the middle of a convoy. And then they blew up eight or ten ships. It was crazy wild. 
We corralled what was left of the convoy, got all the ships together again. The home front, Jean Doyle. In the days that followed, as the news of defeat after defeat reached dust, I can remember my father's strong faith in the ability of General Douglas MacArthur to bring us through. My father was a salesman for Swift and Company when the war began, but with the meat soon to be rationed, that job soon disappeared. Luckily, he was able almost at once to find a job at the Portsmouth Naval Yard, where he worked as a rigger during World War I. From that point on, our lives were determined by the war. The Navy Yard worked three shifts in those years, and he had to take his turn at the 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift. My mother had never been left alone at night before, and much to my annoyance, I found that I was expected to be home by 8 p.m. to keep her company. It was our habit in those days for all our group of friends to walk to Noyce's ice cream stand in the evening, where all the Newbury crowd hung out. When you were that age, being with your own age group seemed very important, and I wasn't very pleased about it. It was about that time that the men in Newbury, where I lived, became rather worried about what would happen if our area was bombed. Newbury did not have its own fire department and relied on Newburyport for assistance. The men were fearful that in an emergency, Newburyport would take care of its own and Newbury would be defenseless. Out of that concern was born the Volunteer Fire Department in Newbury, of which my father was a founding member. From that time until his death, many of his activities centered on the fire department. In July 1942, the War Production Board announced that the national campaign was underway for the collection of scrap iron and steel. The Strand Theater featured a scrap matinee to which students were admitted by presenting a ticket of five pounds of metal. They enthusiastically deposited more than two tons. Joseph Doyle. I wound up in Berzerta, which is a seaport for Tunisia and had been the site of a French submarine base. It was an important port to be at because it changed hands three times. When we were in Berzerta, we were told that there was another American ship in there. I can't remember how I knew it, but that Dr. Dan Leary of Newburyport was supposed to be on board that ship as a medical officer at Oran. I had my signalman ask to verify that he was on board, and Dr. Leary invited me over to his ship for dinner, an invitation I gladly accepted because they had much better food than we had. I was having dinner with him in his wardroom when a message came up that they wanted him in the infirmary because a sailor had dived overboard and cut his head, which needed stitching. He invited me to go down there with him, and which I did. As the medical corpsman was shaving the boy's head, Dr. Leary was carrying on light conversation with him to relieve his mind and ease his discomfort. The conversation went something like this. Where are you from, son? Well, I'm from New Hampshire. Dr. Leary said, where in New Hampshire? The boy said, oh, you'd never know. It's, it's just a little place. Try me, said Dr. Leary. The boy said, Seabrook. Dr. Leary said, well, we're from the port, bub. Now, in the middle of Africa, to come up with that seems like a little bit of a coincidence. Robert Fuller. We finally approached the island that we were going to attack. It's called Gruvutu. We're drawing an awful lot of fire from the Japanese who are on the island. Our company commander got up to tell us to keep our heads down, and he was shot in the head and fell in among the men. He had been promoted to major that same day, but don't think he ever knew it. That wasn't a very good sight, for he had gotten our attention just before he got hit in the head. The Japanese landing crafts are metal, so they are just skimming our gunnels instead of firing into the body of our boat, and that was a real break, for you all probably would have been killed in the boat. In the front of the boat, there were two holes for machine gunners in the bow. They can machine gun as they go in. Behind them, and between them handling and steering the landing craft is the coxswain. All three of these men are coast guards. Well, the first gunner was shot in the head and shot in the chest, and he dropped down the hole. The second gunner does the same thing. He's shot in the head and the face and killed, and he fell dead into the boat. Now the coxswain's exposed. 
So he was shot up all in the head and the face and the chest, and he fell dead over us. And I was right under the coxswain, and I just thought he had fallen or something. So I cursed him, saying, you stupid son of a bitch, can't you even stand on your feet? And then I looked down, and he's a horrible mess. All three, the machine gunners and the coxswains on every one of our boats, the two newest machine gunners and the coxswains were all killed. It was a one-way trip for all those Coast Guardsmen. Like a miracle, though, leaning against the gunnels was a Lieutenant J.G. from the Navy, and he reached over and he grabbed the wheel and he kept the boat on course and he kept it heading toward the beach, which really wasn't very far. And when it grounded, he said, this is it. And I said, this is what? And he said, this is it. Get out of here. So we go over the side and as I said, the, this is a barge ship, and there was no ramp. And a lot of men were carrying a lot of gear. And when they went over the side, the water was too deep, and they never came up. And there was all sorts of pain and fright, an awful lot of excitement on the landing. So the best you could do was keep your head down and wade towards the beach and form a line to engage the enemy. There's nothing more unpleasant than an amphibious landing. Robert Fuller. Home front, Vincent Clancy. The war changed our lives in so many ways. As the years went on, there were more and more shortages. One couldn't buy appliances like thermos jugs, irons, toasters, etc. I can remember my aunt borrowing our picnic jug and accidentally breaking it. It was like a major catastrophe. She couldn't replace it, so she gave us her large cooler. There was nothing else she could do. You know, meat was rationed, and stuff like Crisco, you know, fats. They used that to make ammunition, believe it or not. I don't know what your mother does for fat anymore, but bacon fat, any drippings from hamburgers, and other meats were put in a can and kept in the refrigerator. They got hard, and then you took it to the local butcher shop. You'd get like three cents a pound for whatever you had. The stuff was used to make ammunition. You religiously saved that stuff. Meat was rationed and a lot of canned goods. Canned meats, canned fish, canned salmon, and tuna fish. Shoes of all things were rationed and gasoline was rationed. You had to have your sticker for your car. A sticker, B sticker, and C sticker. A was just an ordinary person. The car was strictly for pleasure. B sticker was a combination of business and pleasure. You were allowed a little more gas. Seasicker meant you worked at the Navy Yard or worked a defense job and you needed gas to get back and forth to work on submarines in Portsmouth or repair shops or something like that. You were allowed so many gallons a week. Tires were rationed. In order to buy a tire, you had to go before a rationing board. First for a slip to buy a new tire, not a second-hand tire, but a new tire. You had to have a slip to do it. Donald Zabriskie. On December 1, 1943, my parents were notified that their son and my brother, PFC Howard J. Zabriskie, USMC, was killed in action in the Battle of Bougainville in the South Pacific. He was 21 years old. Flash, as he was called, was prominent in football and baseball as well as an entertainer. He graduated from Newburyport High School in 1940 and enlisted in the Marines on May 8, 1942. Howard was given the name Flash by his teammates at Newburyport High School. During a scrimmage, Howard recovered a fumble in the other team's backfield, whereupon members of his team commented on his quickness. His response was, just call me Flash. And so they did for the rest of his short life. Flash had a wonderful personality and was well liked by persons of all ages. He loved to sing and dance. In the high school campus capers, in his senior year, he sang Tangerine while dressed as a sailor and brought the show to a stop. I'll never forget how the audience gave him a standing ovation. I was in boot camp when I was told by a drill instructor that my brother had been killed in action. Since I was due home by December 4 for a 10-day furlough, 
My parents had been hoping that I would not learn of his death until they had the opportunity to tell me, but this was not to be. In the months that followed, we learned how he had met his death. In late November 1943, after months in Samoa and New Zealand, Marines occupied a Japanese roadblock on the Numa Numa Trail that apparently had been abandoned. Flash took the point or lead of this patrol. The Japanese decided to come back. They found the Marines, and a fight ensued. The Marines held the position as long as they could, but on November 21st, the Japanese attacked again. Among the losses was Flash. At that time, a number of hearts were broken back home. His mother, father, sisters, brothers, and a number of close friends never got over his passing. Homefront, Margaret Carey. During that time, Ted Elliott was the head of the Red Cross and he was teaching first aid classes. Anybody who was an air raid warden also had to be geared in first aid. One of the funny things that happened was that we had nothing like ambulances or anything like that. We had to make up everything. We had to roll our own bandages. About all we had was mercuricomb and ripped up sheets. This was not a very pricey operation. They took all of the trucks from Atkinson's and Cashman's and all of the flat body trucks and these were our ambulances. Now Ted was six feet tall and I'm about five two. We took oars or poles and we wrapped blankets around the poles. Then we placed the person, who was usually by this time pretty well wrapped up in bandages and couldn't move a muscle in the middle of all this, and lifted him onto the truck. My first experience was my worst. I was too short to reach up to get an injured man up into the truck, and so the poor guy slid down past me. It was really funny. Ted said, I think we better reverse this operation. The guy said, I'm going home. I don't know who you two are going to blame, but I'm going home. This was my first experience with rescue work. Robert Fuller. Finally, we got up, and there was our first view of the battlefield. It was glorious. Navy dime bombers were hitting the top of the hill to neutralize the cave where some of the fire that we were getting was coming from. They had AA gun that they were firing on us, and that was a thrill. Anyway, a group of us moved into an area where we were firing on Tananbogo, killing Japanese just as fast as we could pull the trigger, and they were, of course, killing a lot of us too. We went into an area so we could lay down more, and over there, and we were protected by a dugout, which is a, a building covered with sandbags. Three Japanese came out, however, and they bayoneted one of us and ran back into the dugout. We couldn't have that situation at our back, so the captain said, we've got to neutralize that. There were only three of us. The captain wasn't going in, so I did. It was a terrible episode. I got the hell beat out of me. I mean, I think every bone in my body was aching when this was over. I couldn't light a cigarette. My mouth was all puffed up. My eyes were closed. Everything I had on was destroyed. I thought I was fighting three Japanese. When I got in there, I realized I was fighting more. There were, there were really eight of them. I had the benefit of the dark, and I had the benefit of the crowded conditions because everything was an enemy to me. When the thing ended, the Japanese, the eight Japanese, were killed, were dead. But it wasn't quite that they were dead. They were all dying, and many of them were unconscious with groaning and moaning. But it was so unnerving that the captain couldn't take it. We had to go in and finish them off, which was very distasteful. Frank Shepardson. I joined the U.S. Army Air Force and went to Atlantic City for my basic training. It was beautiful. They had a big field set up for combat training and we'd take our physical exercise right on the beach. A lot of the times we'd have to march up to the boardwalk and sing, Up we go in the wild blue yonder, the Air Force song. The girls would be on vacation and they'd sit right by the rails and watch the soldiers walking up and down. In those days there used to be the steel pier where all the big famous orchestras came in. In fact, 
That's where they would pick Miss America each year. Later, I went to Fort Carson in Denver, Colorado for Ordnance and Ammunition School to learn about fuses, and then I was shipped to the Pacific. Frank Shepardson. George Duffy. The next morning, after our capture by the Germans, they allowed us on deck. We had 72 people on board the raider, and that was as many prisoners as the captain wanted to take, so he went to an area in the South Atlantic where he'd meet other German ships who would take his 72 prisoners. So there I am. I'm just 20 years old, and I'm a prisoner of the Germans. After a month on the raider, we were transferred to this big German oil tanker. We went across the Indian Ocean into the port of Jakarta, Java, there they turned us over to the Japanese in early November 1942. Harold Reader. I enlisted in 1942. I took my exam and was accepted as an aviation cadet, training for flying. It was October 1942 before I was called to active duty because the training takes so long. After training to be a radio operator for heavy bomber, I joined a crew to operate the B-17. We took off as part of the 57th Bomb Group. Each squadron was given 18 planes and there were four squadrons to a group. Right away, the big adventure started. The landing field at Goose Bay was almost eight inches of frozen, compacted snow. There were big poles with red lights in the runway. Then we were on the North Atlantic. Six hours out, the navigator could no longer shoot the stars, so to speak. So I called the radio station in Iceland, and they gave us a fix that told us that we were heading in the right direction. Just before we got to Ireland, we ran into a bad storm. We had to throw everything overboard. We threw out the guns, the ammunition, and other things that we loaded at Goose Bay to bring to England. We didn't have any gas. We got in touch with the flight commander base at Belfast, which directed us to a field. Finally, after a week and a half, we had to take off from a place about the size of Plum Island. After another week and a half, we took off for Ireland. Due to the fact that the Nazis were very active with their fighter planes and medium bombers, we crossed the Irish Sea at an average height of 25 feet. The camera that we used to take pictures of the bomb strike was in the radio room, so I got to take care of the radio and photograph the bomb strikes until we landed safely. Harold Reader. It wasn't long after the war began that Suffolk Farms came to Newbury. Mostly this was the market gardening company that raised spinach. The young people in the area were recruited to work there to aid the war effort. In the early autumn when school was over, a tractor with a flat bed attached would go up High Street and pick up students to work on the farm to pick the spinach. In the summer, we had full-time jobs in the spinach fields. It was a nine-hour day in the hot sun. But we were paid relatively well, and it was like a social event. Gangs of us would be picked up in trucks and assigned various jobs in fields like weeding and thinning out. Harvesting was the most fun. We would be given a bushel basket and a knife and assigned a row. When the basket was half full, we called for ice, which a boy would bring to us. There were also workers assigned to walk around with water jugs. Picking the spinach was the better job because we were paid by the pounds you picked, and you could make more money that way. When the basket was full, we took it over to be weighed and to have our tickets punched. The older boys who could drive got jobs driving the tractors. At noon, we would all stop to eat lunch under the big tree on Little Lane. It was demanding work, but in many ways, it was a socializing event where you got to know a lot of people, some of whom had been brought in from Revere, where the company originated. There were two incidents at Plum Island, which I thought were pretty funny. One time from Plum Island Beach, we were watching the target plane go. There was a small target plane that would take this great big thing, like a windsock balloon, in the back of it, and they had to shoot at that. This was a new gun crew, and they shot the tail off the plane. The guy went right down into the water, and the Coast Guard picked him up. Two hours later, he was back in the air with another plane, but he said they'd better learn how to shoot this time. These are the two incidences, but they were probably others. Leonard Knox. When I got to the Newport training base, this young fellow from Connecticut said to me, let's join the submarine service. So being young and foolish, I said, sure, let's go. A couple of days later, I was going to 
New London, Connecticut to the submarine base and later to San Francisco where they put thousands of us in a big ship and took us across the ocean to the Hawaiian island to Honolulu where they finally assigned me to a su submarine called the USS Steelhead. I spent the rest of the war on the Steelhead. Submarine service had a crew of about 65 men. We were a close-knit group. It was the type of life that once you went to sea, you wouldn't see sunlight for three months. You ran under the water all day long, and you would come up at night because you ran underwater on a battery. It was tough when you sank ships and you got depth charged by the destroyers. When you sank ships, they'd see the torpedoes. The destroyers would come over where you were and start dropping depth charges. These were trying moments when we wondered if one was going to hit us. But it was no worse than being in the Army or being in the Air Corps. It was something I was in, and I more or less accepted it. Joseph Doyle. We loaded our troops on board for Sicily, which was the first major invasion out of Africa. They knew we were coming because they had been bombing us all along. On the actual night we were sailing out of Bizerta, a big bombardment came over. As we were going out, we caught a German bomber in the searchlight and hit it. We saw this parachute coming down and landed about 50 yards off our bow. Of course, I've got a 45 wrapped on my belt, tr trying to look efficient. As they raised the German to the deck, I didn't know what to say to him. I'd never taken a prisoner before. As he came up, I asked whether he was German or Italian. He said, I am German. Italians are swine. Do you understand? I said, do you have a gun? He said, yes. I told him to give it to me, but as he reached for his gun, a captain in the American 3rd Division standing behind me delivered that poor man such a punch and explained in no uncertain terms that he could have shot me. They took the gun away from him, and I took the German into my quarters, gave him some coffee. I found out that he had also been a teacher. He was a Sudeten Czech who taught English. His name was Joseph Haroska. I wondered later whatever happened to him. From there we went to Sicily. In Sicily we had the first fatalities from gunfire. The LCI No. 1, which was the first LCI built, had a load of tro troops on board and an 88 millimeter gun hit the troop compartment on the outside. It blew out the inside and killed everybody in it. The place looked like a meat market. It made all of us sad for the entire evening. After Salerno, we went up to Anzio in an effort to get closer to Rome. Anzio was another beach, and there was no resistance at all to the initial landing. But after we got in there, the Germans had one end of the town, and we had the other. They had big guns, which they were shooting right down the center of the street. We were afraid to go ashore, and the foot soldiers couldn't get near our ship. General Clark received much criticism for his unwillingness to break through. Anzio became mired down. Outside of Anzio, there's a very famous monastery, Monte Cassino. It was on top of a mountain and was a very important observatory. You could see for miles around. We wanted to knock it out, but nobody could get up the mountain. One of the groups that tried to get up that mountain were some mercenary troops that we carried from Africa. They were night fighters who fought in the dark. Their pay was based on the number of ears that they brought each brought back. They were very religious people, and amongst their laws, where there was one that said they had to have their meat live and freshly butchered. When we transported them, we had about 150 troops on board that brought their fresh meat with them, live, in the form of goats. Now, the weather is apt to get tough in the Mediterranean, and we'd get tossed about sometimes. You have never smelled anything as bad as a ship that has spent three days with 150 seasick Arabs and an equal number of seasick goats on board. <laughs> Michael Toomey, I was in the Navy. I was on a heavy cruiser. That's a different type of ship. A cruiser isn't as big as a battleship. It's a good size, probably fits 600 people, and they carry an awful lot of guns. 
big caliber guns, 8-inch guns, 9-inch guns, 40-millimeter guns, 20-millimeter guns. In World War II, the ships were divided into tasks for, task forces of carriers, cruisers, and destroyers. And if there were landings or invasions, they would insist on bombarding at the enemy territory with these big guns. I was on an 8-inch gun. I served in the Navy from February 1943 to February 1946, just three years. I left high school my junior year. I had just turned 17 and I didn't have to volunteer. You weren't drafted into the service during World War II until you were 18. I spent all my time in the Pacific Ocean, where about all the Navy action was. After the second atom bomb exploded at Nagasaki, I was on the cruiser Boston. We took the Boston right into Nagasaki, and they ordered 10 of us to walk the streets of Nagasaki, which we did. The reason we did that was to assure the Japanese people there was no danger from radiation. I later died from leukemia, but I was luckily in my 80s. Henry Martin. I was in the Navy during the war and took part in several invasions in the European theater, Sicily, Anzio, and North Africa. I met Ernie Pyle, who was a great war hero. He was on our ship, the USS Biscayne. It was a destroyer. He was a great war correspondent. In the invasion of Anzio, old blood and guts, General George Patton was on our ship. We had the Marines, the Army, and the Navy on our ship. While I was in North Africa, I met Dr. Leary. I also took part in the invasion of Okinawa. Basically, my service took me all around the world. Henry Martin. Robert Fuller. The Battle of Guadalcanal lasted from August to February, and in September, we finally got some reinforcements. We had run out of food, we had run out of ammunition, and Admiral Fletcher, who was in charge of the task force, got most of the men off the boats. Some of our supplies, half of our ammunition, most of the things we needed, he took away. He was too afraid his aircraft carriers would be sunk. He wasn't going to rush them, and apparently he didn't have much confidence in the 1st Marine Division anyway. He probably figured we were all going to die or be taken prisoner. At first, we ate the little cans of sea rations, one can per man, per meal, and then it got to be one man per can per day. And then it was one can for two men per day, and those sea rations carried chocolate bars, and the chocolate bars were called into penalty of death, melted down, and we got half a cup of chocolate water. So what we depended on was Japanese rice, but it was full of maggots. But we were told that the maggots were protein and that we needed protein, so don't stick your nose up at it. And we ate the Japanese rice, maggots and all, and we were damn glad to get it. But there was one Navy ship called a Beetle Grew, and it wasn't a fighting ship. I think it was a repair ship. Somehow it broke loose of the fleet, and it came in, and he on that ship had a bunch of flour, peaches, and spam, and we could have all we could get off in one tide. So we ate spam until anyone who was in the Solomons won't eat spam today. But the first one we ate with a can in each hand, it was just great. Home front, Natalie Canapa. I wasn't into politics. Jack Kelleher, I think, was our mayor. Everybody was so tied up in the war that it didn't matter. There were no really big decisions to be made. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't build because building supplies were unavailable. Many foods were rationed. I worked for Lincoln's which was a department store. It was a time when you couldn't buy nylons. So when they had a big shipment of nylons come in, I had a lot of friends then. They'd call me up and I'd get them nylons. Then the management of the store decided one day to put them out on sale for everyone. Kennedy's butter store was next door and you couldn't get butter. So when they both 
had nylons and butter, they'd get together and say, we'll put them all out this day. Words passed fast, and the long lines would go into Lincoln's, into Kennedy's, and to the drugstore for cigarettes, and that line would be, go right down to the foot of Green Street. They'd come in to get their nylons, and they'd take any size. They didn't care. They'd get their nylons, and from there they would get a pound of butter, and from there they would go to get a pack of cigarettes. The chairman of the Newburyport Salvage Committee, Henry C. Leonard, announced that the committee would begin to collect washed silk stockings for the Army and Navy. The stockings will be collected in lots of 100 pounds and sent to New York. They will be used for the manufacture of powder bags, as silk burns completely and leaves no embers, which makes for greater speed in the recharge of guns. Massachusetts drivers were put on a modified ban, no pleasure driving. Driving to places of amusement must be limited to the use of a gallon and a half a week. Without notice, the government placed shoes on the rationing list. Men, women, and children could only purchase three pairs of shoes a year. In January 1943, the War Shipping Administration mailed a check for $5,000 to Alice Duffy, George's mother, in full settlement of all claims under war risk insurance on the life of George W. Duffy. It wasn't until April 23, 1943, that George was able to send a letter to say that he was okay and would be home safe and sound after the war was over. The memorial service was canceled, and his mother, without a question, returned the $5,000. Gene Palumbo. I said to the two infantry kids, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I'm getting the hell out of here because there isn't anything here I can do. They said, well, we're going with you. So I said, if you're going to come with me, follow behind me, and let's get in the tank tracks because this place is loaded with mines. They followed me, and on the way back to the river, one of them taps me on the shoulders. I can't swim. They had never seen combat before. I said to him, all I can tell you is that this is a hard water to get through, but I'll dive in and try to get across and hold on to the bank, and all you have to do is run, jump, and stick your hand out. The river was 12 or 14 feet wide, so this kid took a long running jump, paddled a little, and then I reached out and grabbed him. I pulled him in, got him up onto the bank, and I told the other one to come on. The Germans were laying downstream. He started, he ran, and jumped. I must have missed him by six inches. And I still see him in my sleep and how I miss this kid's hand at the Battle of Casino, deep in German territory. I don't know where they shot him in the water or what. Gene Palumbo. Harold Reader. One week after landing, we had our first mission, mission, which was to southern Germany. Actually, it was a nine-hour flight coming and going. You always had a tailwind going in from England to the continent, but coming out, you had a headwind, so it took longer to come home. We lost two engines, and we had to climb over the French Alps in order to get back. We approached Nancy, a place where the Germans used to distribute their troops, and we shot the place up. We then go to the coast between northern France and England. We had to drop some... Balturk into the channel to gain some altitude. We ended on the beach, and we were gone for three days. They didn't know where we were. We landed belly up with no struts. There are four engines on a B-17, and we landed with two. They took us to our base, Glatton, and two days later, we were in the air again. I hit the first four daylight raids ever thrown in Berlin, and they were tough missions. We went as far as Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Munich. Plus, we burned Hamburg and Birmingham. The crew that I was on there with became a lead crew, so that we led our squadron and sometimes the entire group into the targets to drop bombs. We continued to be under attack, and we came off the target and shot down a plane and got the Silver Star. Harold Reader. In February 1943, men aged 38 to 45 now faced the draft if they did not work at jobs the government considered essential. A new song became very popular. This is the Army Mr. Jones. This is the Army Mr. Jones. No private rooms or telephones. You had your breakfast in bed before, but, but you won't have it there anymore. This is the Army Mr. Green. We like the barracks nice and clean. You had a housemaid to clean your floor. But she won't help you out anymore. 
In June, a curfew went into effect. The curfew shall ring henceforth at 9.30 nightly. No child under 16 years of age shall be on any street, park, or public way. On April 17, 1943, the Daily News reported that more than $1.2 million worth of war bonds had been sold in Newburyport. By 1943, 596 men and women of Newburyport who were in the service were members of the IC Church on Green Street. An honor roll with their names was placed on the lawn of the church in October. Many new victory gardens were being established. One of these was at the Old South End Stadium. As the male teachers left for the war, it became apparent that there was a shortage of vocational teaching t- training teachers. Women were being brought in to be trained to take over these courses. 1943, Jean Palumbo. We got orders to go back in the stone quarry. There was the place we used to call the pimple. It was a point like a pimple on the face, which you used to have to get around. We got back in there, where we were told to use more fire in there because of all the infantrymen were all shot up. They were all banged up, killed, and wounded. It was so bad in the battle that we had to stop for one hour so that our Red Cross and their Red Cross could go up the hill and tell which bodies were wounded. Then we started fighting again. We went back into casino again. We went in and the captain said it was the same situation here again, so we spread out. The captain went straight, the other tank went left and stopped. He said, let them have it, Palumbo, and I said okay. I gave them all the shells and then kicked the gun from underneath and fired and fired. All of a sudden, I looked through my periscope and there's a German coming out. He's pointing a grenade on the end of his rifle. I said, Graf, Germans, real fast at seven or eight o'clock. I reached down and put a 30 millimeter machine gun and started to spray all over the ground. It's a good thing I did because the kid, German, got all nervous when he saw all the bullets. He raised his gun a little and went over our turret right over the top of me. He jumped back into the cell where he had been hiding. I said, all right, King, the SOB's in the cellar. Fire, fire. And he did. That's about all we could do in casino. We were wiped out. All of the guys were getting blown apart. The infantry were too. We didn't take casino. The English came in and they said, well, Yank, we'll show you how to take casino. And I said, if you can take it, good luck to you. They were there for a month and they couldn't take it. Gene Palumbo. Norm Doyle. When Guam was occupied by the Japanese, it was all bombed out and the church was bombed. The Spanish bishop had fled the Japanese invasion. While we were there, Guam changed hands and the Americans took it over. When the Spanish bishop came back, the word went out that he was going to hold confirmation classes. 500 Navy guys got confirmed. I was a sponsor to one of the kids, and and here we were in a church with no roof on it, and he was doing confirmations. Homefront, Gene Doyle. When I was in grade school, they had male cheerleaders at the high school football games. One of the liveliest was Sweets Chatney. He had a wonderful, engaging personality, and all of us youngsters loved him. I can remember an evening at City Hall when they were doing some kind of a skit and Sweets played the part of the winner in a fishing bowl drawing for going into the service. We all laughed as his name was drawn out and thought nothing of it. I remembered this when the news came that Sweets had been killed in action in the Pacific. How ironic. He was a fine young man. It was a great loss to the community. Virginia Lowell. When Ralph knew he was going into the service, we decided to move back to Newburyport for the duration. We found a house we liked on Purchase Street just two away from my parents. The bus stop was almost in front of my door, which would prove useful as I didn't have a car. The telephone company would not give me a phone. My father rigged rigged up a wire contraption going from my house along my back fence, continuing along my neighbors and into my house. If I needed help, I could press a little button that he put on so that I could contact him if I needed. I had a good sized yard, so I planted a victory garden that really flourished. We were given stamps when we bought different essential articles. You needed stamps to buy meat. Every couple of days I would push my daughter in my stroller up to State Street to stand in a long line of people, all hoping to be able to buy some meat. It was limited and often the store would run out when you reached the counter. I had very little meat during the war. I became anemic and had to visit Dr. Bullard weekly for liver shots. 
William Dickey, Tuesday, January 22, 1943. They have been unloading German and Italian prisoners of war on our dock. They have come from Tunisia where there is a heavy fight going on. They put them in a prison camp at the end of the dock, which they kept lighted. It is a beacon for the enemy places, and the light silhouettes us. The Germans are all well disciplined. When they ta- came down the quay, they sat in company formation and marching columns. The Italians are a disgrace. They just straggle down, crying, begging for food and cigarettes as they go by the gangway. Dr. Leary from New Report is aboard the USS Vulcan, which is tied up in front of us, but I haven't been able to get to him. The Vulcan is the repair shop for the combat vessels, while we are the repair shop for the landing craft and auxiliaries. William Dickey, Sunday, July 4th, 1943. When I went over the staging area near Ferryville to work on an LST, a landing ship tank, I met Eddie Robinson from New Report, whose ship had just been sunk. I went back to the USS Delta and got some of my clothes to give him, as he had nothing. I also met a chase kid from New Report while I was working on the landing craft at the staging area. 1944, the home front. By 1944, the shortage of help was beginning to hurt vital industries. The synthetic rubber industry complained that it would, it would be unable to meet war and essential home front needs if its workers were drafted. President Roosevelt signed the GI Bill of Rights on June 22, 1944. This bill was placed to provide assistance to the men and women after World War II for college and vocational education with help for one-year unemployment compensation and loans for businesses and homes. Movies were playing their role by projecting hope and sacrifice as they did in Going My Way, the most popular movie of the time. New reporters needed all the support they could get as 20 of their men lost their lives in 1944. Gold stars were appearing in windows across New Report neighborhoods. Our city was growing weary of the war and its death toll. Norman Doyle. I think 44 was a very interesting year. We were in off the water patrol in the Pacific and we went to midnight mass in a baseball field in Hawaii. There must have been about 5,000 servicemen at that mass. The band struck up church music. You could tell it wasn't a really religious band. It turns out it was Bob Crosby and the Bobcats, and that was Bing Crosby's brother. Another surprise was coming. This beautiful voice started singing the hymns, and it turns out it was Doris Day. It was like a big hit show, except they were singing church music. It took about two and a half hours to serve communion. There were three priests, and in 1945, most of us who survived the big war came home. Ed Mullen. I got married in July of 1941, and it was in December of 41 that Pearl Harbor was bombed. My wife and I didn't realize the effect it would have on all of us. At that time, I was working for a company that you would know as Timex, and I was in charge of the tool design department, which was very important. We were making all sorts of timing devices for artillery shells and for things along that particular line. I had an industrial deferment, and in 1944, when things got pretty rough over the Pacific, they issued an edict that all men under 26 must go into the service. I had my deferment, but a clerk in the personnel department goofed and didn't apply for my deferment. As a result, I got on the list, and even though the company fought to get me back off the list, I ended up going into the service. Looking back, I was making a much bigger contribution back home than I was being one of many over there, but so be it. George Duffy. One aspect of all camps that I was in on Java and Sumatra, and and those were military as opposed to civilian internee camps, was that the Japanese allowed our own internal organization and discipline. If the senior ranking officer prisoner was British, then the camp was run in British style. That was the case at Tanjong Java, 
where my shipmates and I were handed over by the German Navy in early November 1942. I began keeping a journal, most of which survived with me. This is what I wrote about December 25th, 1943. Christmas was celebrated in quite a manner, notwithstanding the circumstances. There were church services in the morning and at 10.30 a semi-athletic meet, which included three-legged races, sack races, etc. A long-standing custom in the British Army is that officers serve dinner to the men on Christmas Day. This was followed here, but since there were no English soldiers in my barracks, a few of us, including Captain Peterson, my captain, did the honors. A year later, December of 1944, I was in Sumatra, building a railroad. The easy life of Java had turned into a desperate, life-threatening existence. In the first place, we had difficulty getting there. Between May and September, 6,600 of us were transported in four ships. Two of those ships were sunk by British submarines with a loss of 1,640 prisoners. We were overworked, underfed, and provided with no medical care. Before 20, December 25th arrived, 104 men had died. On Christmas Day, although we were allowed to observe it and the work parties were kept in camp, there was no religious service. The clergy, having been back, in, back to Java with those who were unfit or non-essential to railway construction, there were no fun and games either. In fact, my journal speaks of nothing but food. Everyone had hoarded something for the day. Everything of our kits went into the primitive mind banquets to observe the birthday of Christ. Constant Christuk. We had numerous encounters, but the one that stands out in my mind is the battle we had at Vela Gulf. Our destroyer squadron, which consisted of six destroyers, went up deep into Japanese territory. At midnight, we intercepted a Tokyo Express. That was our name for the Japanese troop ships, passenger ships, and supply ships coming down from their territory in the north, Tokyo Express. We engaged them in battle and sank them with our torpedoes. That was the Battle of Vela Gulf. Perhaps the second most significant part of my being in the Navy was the surrender of the Japanese-owned and held islands, the Bonin Islands, way up north, about 600 miles from Japan. The surrender of the Bonin Islands took place on our ship one day after the surrender of Japan itself on the battleship Missouri, which was in Tokyo Harbor. Milton McFarlane commented, Hundreds of servicemen had flags in their windows. Some had had as many as five flags for five members of the family. Two of my brothers were called on the same day. One went in the Navy and one went in the Army. I was in the North Atlantic at the time. I also had a brother who was in the Air Force. Four out of five children were involved in the war effort. Many boys and girls left school to work in defense industries. There was a crying need for all the help they could get. A lot of women started working in factories, like Rosie the Riveter. They were capable, dedicated, and patriotic. They did everything possible to fill in the void when the men left town. Toll Manufacturing Company made trachea tubes for the war effort. They were used to put in the mouths of men who had been shot so they could breathe. They were made of silver. The people at home experienced many shortages, and people went without. They were willing to sacrifice. From Margaret Carey, I got stuck in the cook's job in Fowles. He was called up and he had to go back into the service. The most memorable experience I had up there is that they delivered a whole steer and I was supposed to sit and cut it up. I said, I don't even know where to cut. So they took out a purple indelible pencil, they drew lines, and I ended up standing in the sink sawing this great big steer. I said I never took this job for this, but it was funny. Junior Lalo was my dishwasher at the time. He eventually became the mayor. I worked as a cook in the daytime, and then I took the National Training Act that allowed me to be a machinist. I was one of the first three women machinists in Toll. 
We worked on Radar, and that was where I got my nickname. They called me Radar. It was fun. I had a little jeweler's blade, and I made the knobs that turned the thing. Parts of it were made in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and here in Newburyport. All the parts were then assembled at another place so that nobody would know the complete design. They were gold-plated here, which was to get rid of contaminants. I had to sign a form saying that if the man was called back whose job I replaced, that I would give up my job. Joseph Doyle. When we left Anzio, Italy, everyone knew what was coming next. It was the invasion of France. Nobody knew where it was going to be or when it was going to be, but they knew it was coming because of all the supplies that were going into England. It was unbelievable. The troops, the vehicles, the tanks that were there. On June 3, 1944, we put troops on board in Plymouth, England and headed for Normandy. We had on board the 102nd Airborne Division, which sounds a little odd because we were a naval ship and the airborne people came out of airplanes. They had so many troops going into battle that they ran out of airplanes and gliders, and they had to put some of the troops on board landing crafts like ours. On June 6, 1944, after two days at sea, with the poor men so seasick that I don't know how they managed to get off the ship, we took part in the greatest battle in the history of the world. The sight was absolutely unbelievable. If you can imagine the shore of Plum Island with Boar's Head way to the left, and Cape Ann to the right, and every patch of water that you could see in that water had a ship on it. You could hardly see the water for the ships. There were ships of all kinds. There were ships large and small, landing craft, big landing craft, transports, destroyers, submarine chasers, cruisers, battleships, and rocket ships. After you viewed the vast array of ships, you took your binoculars out then you could see the superstructures of ships that were over the horizon you couldn't see with the naked eye. One of the more remarkable ships there was the ship run by the Free Greeks, which was an old British battleship that had literally been cut in half, with only one 14-inch gun remaining on top. So the ship could be sailed close to shore and fire that one long gun, which was capable of shooting 26 to 30 miles inland. The logistics involved in getting the troops on the beach were horrendous. The rise and fall of the tide along the Normandy coast is one of the highest in the world. They would put the landing ship on the beach, then throw out the anchor and wait until the tide went out again. Then they were stuck there until the tide came back in. Trucks could come alongside the ships and fill up. Needless to say, it was a frightening experience for the men aboard the landing ships that had to wait for the change of tide. The German guns were still firing sporadically from above. When the Allies landed, there was no harbor. And you have to have a harbor if you're going to bring in heavy supplies. So they built an artificial harbor, a remarkable task. The harbor consisted of a breakwater made by sinking 12 Liberty ships in a line. And in front of those, they had these huge concrete caissons which were structures that were as big as a house. They were brought over from England by barges, floated in, put in position, and then sunk to form a permanent breakwater. Beyond that, they had a pontoon highway built to the beach so that trucks could go right on the beach on the pontoons. For about five or ten days, it worked as planned. And then, after that, they had the greatest storm they'd ever had in the English Channel, which blew it all to pieces. Herbert Bean. I was 32 years old when I was drafted into the Army in 1941. Originally, I signed up for the Seabees, but they never called me, and that's how I was able to be drafted and ended up overseas. The attitude of the people changed after the attack on Pearl Harbor. At my age, I was considered one of the oldies. I was married at the time. I had been married since 1937. But that didn't matter as far as the draft was concerned. As long as you could walk, they'd take you. A year or two after I went in, they stopped drafting people my age, but I was already out of the country. I went overseas the latter part of 43. I was trained for cryptographic decoding. 
Then I was assigned to the 99th Division of the Ardennes Forest. I was assigned as one of the guards to a machine gun placement. Two of us were assigned to that gun, and that was our unit. Then on December 16, all hell broke loose. That's when the Germans opened up with their artillery barrages and everything else they owned. That was the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. They eventually pushed us back quite a way. We covered a long area, but we were pretty thin. We managed to hang on pretty well, but they did finally push us back. Czar Garfi. We got hit in the war. We snuck in through the China Sea at midnight when it was dark. The whole fleet went in through the China Sea. We did an awful lot of damage. And when we came out at noon, prouder than a peacock, is when we got hit. We got hit by two kamikazes and a bomb. We were coming out of Formosa and we were on our, on what you call one easy. This means you hang around your gun and you don't do any work. You work around the gun. And when you go to eat, you eat two at a time. So this other fellow and myself went down to eat at the galley and a torpedo defense sounded. This means that just a gun is run. But when the torpedo defense sounded, and then general quarters sounded, and then you go, oh, no. And this is when we got hit by the kamikazes. First the bombs hit, and then the plane came right down and smashed. And then we got hit by another kamikaze. The kamikaze pilots flew into planes and ships and they lost their lives. They committed suicide. It's a religion to them. They think they're going to straight to heaven. Little do they realize they might go to hell. It was such a big mess. There were about 300 killed and wounded. When you say here, missing in action, you might as well say goodbye. You know what I mean? Where are you missing to? Where are you going to go to? It is just that when we got hit, it was almost like an ammunition ship. All we had on the ship were bombs and things for the plane. Our first strike was against the Philippine Islands. And then we went to the South China Sea. We were outside of Tokyo when Japan finally gave up. The whole fleet was there. We were sitting there for days and days and days, and we kept bombing them. This was after they dropped the atomic bomb. We were waiting for them to sign, so we kept on hitting them and hitting them. From Hazen Boyd. Another time that I can remember about the war years. That was kind of fun. It was sort of a field trip. Never in our life had I heard of a field trip, a time out of school to go do something or to take a trip. There was no such thing that I ever remember in my 12 years of school in Newport. We got out of school maybe an hour and a half to two hours early one afternoon. We went out to Low Street in the vicinity of where the Knock Middle School is right now. It was just a big open field, and at this time of the year, maybe it was October or November, the job was to collect as many of these milkweed pods as we possibly could. You'd pick up thistles on your clothing, but that didn't matter. The teacher would say, you can pick those off when we walk back to school. Get the milkweed pod. The milkweed pods we were collecting was for the war effort. We put them into burlap bags, like big onion bags. We filled the bags up with milkweed pods, and we must have had 10 or 12 bags at least filled up in the hour. We took them up, and we took the bags back to the school. At first, we put them in the seventh grade room. When the milkweed pods dried out, they would be light and fluffy. They used those in life preservers or life jackets. In case a pilot's plane was shot down, the aviators would have the life jacket. They called it a K-Pak jacket. It was filled with the milkweed seeds, and it would help to keep the person afloat. We also used to save many things and collect for the war effort we would collect tin cans. They would melt down the metal and it would be used to make something for the war. 
Other things we would collect would be newspapers, tires, old hot water bottles, anything that would be useful. It was all separated. The city of New Report supplied a truck which would come around to the schools and pick up the boxes we had filled. William Plant. I joined my unit at night as a replacement. We were put up in what was known as the Hotel Breeze. It was a very old, old building. I guess it had been a resort hotel in good times. We were there two or three days when the company was called back to Yupin. We were told to leave one platoon back and do the work, and my platoon was the one left out there. They left a kitchen truck with us, so we had some food. Finally, the company commander called out and said, Oh, you're too exposed. I think you better pull back into town tonight. It was about 11 o'clock at night before we got the truck started and everything was moving. And an hour later at midnight, the German paratroopers landed up in the flats out by the hotel. And we were using it as a command post. We got out of there just in time. And believe it or not, that was the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. Percy Purrington. When we got back to France, Everybody was in rags, carrying their stuff, being displaced or being pushed out of their houses. They were living down in cellars and things. Our platoon would take the town, and we'd have to evacuate certain buildings looking for Germans. We would find tons of people just living in the cellars, civilians. It was the only safe place to live unless we blew the house down. I found the German people very, very neat. Their houses and things were neater than the French people. A lot of the little villages over there have a front room where they would meet for local drinks with a curtain in the doorway to the living quarters. It was always the poor wife who was out there working in the bar. The husband seemed to be sitting around in a chair in the other room, but the whole family would troop up there. The children would come right along with their parents and have a drink. Over there they serve wine on a dinner table and everyone drinks it. That's all they drink because the water isn't very good there. We weren't allowed to drink it. We had to put pills in the water to drink it. As the Battle of the Bulge got going, things became pretty hectic. There was a lot of confusion. We had limited tanks. We were near Malmedy, which was the northern hinge of the Bulge. The tanks would hit the Malmedy area, then they would do their thing up there, and they would go back over what was Highway 3 leading to Liège, Belgium. Highway 3 was a cobblestone road with a high crown on it. We had had a lot of sleet and rain and frozen ice, and the tanks would slide off into the ditches. They couldn't stay on the high crown. So we had to get all the engineers and all the infantry we could find, anyone who could handle a shovel. There was a big slag pile, and we shoveled cinders on that highway 12 hours a day for five days to keep the tanks on the road so they, they could use it. It's kind of funny to think of fighting a war with D-handled shovels, but it was a very vital part of the exercise. From there on, it was push, 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 and recapture the area the Germans had taken. Then the war kind of opened up. I won't say it was a foot race, but it was very swift as compared to the pace beforehand. Our assignments continued, putting bridges in, taking bridges out. Jeremiah Doyle, the worst enemy of the American soldier in the Battle of the Bulge was the cold weather. The weather was about zero to 10 degrees. The American army was mostly made up of infantry and artillery men were forced to be out in the cold day and night over a period of about six or seven weeks that the battle lasted. It was difficult to feed the troops. The men lived in the fields and they were so cold that they didn't have an opportunity to change their clothes. Most of the men went about six weeks without even taking off their clothes. They had very serious problems from the feet freezing in the cold weather. The clothing that the American soldiers wore during the Battle of the Bulge was the same clothing that they wore in the streets in the cities in the United States when they were on leave. They didn't have proper clothing and they had only very ordinary equipment. The guns would freeze, the guns were often inadequate, 
because the Germans had superior tanks and superior equipment. The Americans were just not prepared for this battle. Many of the American soldiers were captured during the Battle of the Bulge and remained prisoners of the Germans until the end of the war. During the Battle of the Bulge, I was a runner in an infantry battalion. This was a job that called for me as a private to carry messages from battalion headquarters to the company commander. A battalion had about 1,200 men in it, and a company had about 200 men in it. It was impossible to deliver message by vehicle or by wire or by telephone because the lines had been blown. They would send two messengers with, me with a message to instruct the company commander what he was to do and how he was to fight and how he was to attack. The runner's job was to go through the lines, sometimes even in between the American army and the German army, to see that the messages were delivered. These messages were often delivered at night under the cover of darkness, so it would be difficult for the Germans to see the people delivering the message. They had a big artillery piece that had shot 88 millimeter shells that they would shoot at one messenger or one infantryman if they so chose. This was a job that I had during the six months I was on the front line. Some of the time we fought under the British Army, but most of the time we fought under American command. After I left the destroyer service, I volunteered for submarine service. I spent the rest of the war operating primarily in submarines in the Pacific against the Japanese. When we got to sea, and when we dove, and when we got to our assigned area, we'd be in enemy waters. We'd be submerged all day long, 20 hours a day. We had to surface at night to recharge our batteries. And if you're on a new boat, you don't have to do that. At any rate, this is what we had to do. We carried 24 torpedoes. And if we were on a mine laying mission, we could carry 42 mines. We also carried 96 gallons of fuel that would cover three months. So we stayed out. I never saw the sun, no daylight or anything. You got used to it. It's like you live in another world, you really do. You know what's going on, you know where you are, but submarines are operated by themselves. And the commander of the submarine Pacific, he knew where we were, but we didn't want to tip anybody off as to our whereabouts. We were so close to the Japanese empire that we used to listen to Tokyo Rose. She spoke in English. She was American, but she was American Japanese. I don't know where she got her information, but boy, she had good information. She would kid with us. She was sadly mistaken because she used to say American submarines would never get within 500 miles of the sacred shores of the empire, and there we were, a hundred yards off the beach. We'd all give her a big cheer, you know. She played all good records like Bing Crosby, and she'd have names. She'd say, this record is for so-and-so because he's never going home again. Joseph Doyle. The next six months after that, we transported troops back and forth between the mainland and England. We moved our ship up to Belfast, where we were decommissioned, and gave it over to the British Navy. They put us on the Queen Elizabeth, and we made our way back to Boston. One of the most vivid memories I have is after spending three and a half years overseas, having been involved in six invasions, was to come off the ship in Boston and be met by a naval officer in November of 44 who said to me, Sir, you are out of uniform. Huh. It was the first time I'd had my dress blues on in four years. That sums up my career in the Navy. 1945, the home front. In January 1945, Massachusetts Governor Maurice Tobin made a vigorous protest against the seizure of land on Plum Island for the wildlife sanctuary. By May, people felt sure that the war in Europe was nearing its end. Finally, on May 8, 1945, the bells rang out as the news arrived. 
For a short time, everything stopped as people hugged each other in relief. Prayers were said in gratitude. A celebration of the victory in Europe was tempered, however, by the savage battles being fought in the Pacific. Unaware of the atomic bomb in our possession, the populace expected at least two more years of fighting in the Pacific before peace would be restored. July 5th, 1945, William Dickey. At 0400 hours, while I'm at lunch break, heavy bombers attack the lake area. They get over us with only a minute warning. They drop their flares and the whole lake was like daylight. Planes passed directly over the delta and bombs fell very close. We are covered by shrapnel as everyone is shooting over us. I saw two planes hit and fall by anti-aircraft fire. We do not seem to have any fighter planes to engage them. Quite a bit of damage was done. William Dickey. Despite the loss of so many lives, young men continued to volunteer. My husband, Everett Foley, was one of them. Despite their knowledge of the carnage that was made known after the battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, they went with the belief that it was their duty to defend their country. Although many would be spared these horrors after the bombs were dropped in Japan, they deserve our respect for their willingness to give their lives in the years ahead. Ed Molin. In 1944, I left home to go into what I thought was the Navy. Coincidentally, it was June 6th, the invasion of France. At that time, the Marine Corps decided it needed a few more volunteers, so we were asked individually to <clears throat> volunteer. I was volunteered by the recruiting officer who thought I would make a good Marine. The next morning, I left for Paris Island, South Carolina, and didn't come home until a couple of years afterward. When we went overseas, we landed in a little place called Banica, which is part of Russell Island in the Solomon Islands. Guadalcanal was just south of the Russell Islands. It took us about three weeks to get there in a troop ship. Now, we were down in a hole and stacked six high as we were sleeping, so it wasn't a very comfortable trip. After some time on Banica, we ended up going towards Okinawa. I remember on that trip being at a place called Ulithi, which I had never heard of before, and waking up and seeing more ships in every direction than I ever thought possible. D-Day at Okinawa was April 1st, 1945, which was also Easter Sunday. Our ships were out in the harbor, and we went over the side on cargo nets, a traumatic experience. The water was really turning up, and we were trying to get into LCVPs, a landing craft vehicle, personnel. We were coming over the net with full packs and rifles, and unfortunately, some of our people misstepped. If you misstepped, you went down into the water. You went down like a rock, and you were gone. We lost a few people that way, just going over the side. Then we went in towards the island. Okinawa has a big coral reef around it, which we know and also the Japanese knew. So at the reef, we had to switch from LCVPs to amphibious landing craft because the LCVPs couldn't go over the reef. While we were switching, the Japanese were coming across us with planes because they knew we would have to do this maneuvering. Those that survived went onto the beach and dug in. We watched as the military shot over the top of us at the Japanese, who were at a little airport not far from where we landed. We stayed there for quite a few days. It was a terror situation because at night there would be Japanese infiltrating. You'd be in a foxhole and hear someone scream. You'd wake up in the morning and find out that somebody had got their throat slit. That area of Okinawa was full of caves and the Japanese would hide in them. They would wait for us to go by, come out from behind us, and shoot some of our guys from the back. We got an old Japanese fire engine, which we fixed up, and instead of water, we put in chemicals that are used in flamethrowers. 
We'd come to these caves and yell to give them an opportunity to come out. If they didn't come out and we heard nothing, we'd pump the chemicals into the caves and ignite it. In most cases, there was nothing in them. Once in a while, some people would be in there. It was a matter of kill or be killed. War is not pretty. Donald Zabriskie, on April 7th, 1945, I had an experience that would stay with me for the rest of my life. The Hancock, the ship I was on, was hit by a suicide plane, a kamikaze, off the coast of Okinawa. Many topside personnel were killed, wounded, or blown over the side due to explosions, smoke, and high-octane fires. We were running to general quarters when the Japanese pilot made his run. He flew par parallel with the carrier, about 45 feet above the water. I could see the pilot sitting in his cockpit. He was looking right at us as he increased his speed. He did a rollover, and then he came right back at us, up and over the bow, dropping his arm bomb about 30 to 50 feet above the flight deck. Sixteen of our FGF Corsairs had caught fire. There was other, utter confusion from the plane explosions, heavy black-gray smoke, and five-inch shells going off. It made it very difficult to breathe and function. There were a lot of bodies lying on the flight decks and in the, in the gun mounts. There was a lot of dying going around. Everyone was on his own. Once a person experiences combat and death, the person is never the same. Oh, you have your moments of highs and happiness, but every so often stark, realistic images and pictures come to mind when you least expect them. So many were young, but what courage and guts they showed. America has always been fortunate to have such men when she needed them. Ed Mullen. I can remember very clearly a situation when we had just arrived on the beach and our ships were in the harbor. The ships were bombarding the Japanese and the bombs were going over our heads. We had very strict instructions to stay in our foxholes. It was a tremendous display, better than any fireworks. It was an outstanding thing to see, as grotesque as it may seem. So there was one young fellow in our outfit, about 18 years old, who stayed in his foxhole like he should have. The rest of us were out watching all this happen. A spent shell went down into his foxhole, went into his chest. We picked him up with a blotter. That was only 15 feet from where I was standing. You don't know why these things happen, but they do. I remember diving into a ravine, trying to hide from low-flying Japanese planes, but when you saw them, they were already shooting over your head. There was no hand-to-hand -hand combat, but what we experienced was enough. They were close enough for me. Looking back, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. One of our local politicians a few years ago talked about how we should apologize to the Japanese for dropping the bomb. But that was so wrong because many of us wouldn't be here if we hadn't dropped that bomb, including me. Yes, unfortunately, it killed a lot of people, but fortunately, it saved a lot of lives. I am fortunate and grateful that it happened because it saved my life too. From Judy Kennedy. Three sons and a son-in-law went to war. A family says goodbye to them one at a time and prays daily for their safe return. The family prayed that somehow, if it was God's will, that all four would return alive and well, and they did. I was very young when my dad came home, but I remember well the excitement and happiness that abounded. I was only a baby when he went away, but my mother and older sister talked to me constantly about him so that he would not be a stranger to me when he came home. I still have a picture of all of us at his homecoming, standing on the sidewalk in front of our house with such joy on our faces. He sent a recording from France saying hello to all of us, and I used to play it all the time saying to myself, this is my daddy and wondering if I was ever going to see him again. For the Packer family, their prayers seemed to be answered. Four went away and four came home, while so many others fell in battle.
On August 24, 1945, George Duffy and his comrades received news that the war had ended on the 15th of the month. It took six weeks for word to reach his mother that he was finally coming home. He arrived back in Newburyport on October 8th, happy to be home, but saddened to hear of the deaths of so many of his friends and acquaintances. December 14, 1946, William Dickey. In today's mail was my honorable discharge. It was dated December 14th, so my enlistment was for six years and eight days. William Dickey. It is estimated that 40 million people died worldwide in World War II. The mind cannot comprehend such a figure or a cataclysm of such dimensions. The mind and the heart are, however, capable of understanding 43, the number of new reporters lost in the war. They died a long way from the North End and the South End, from Three Roads and Joppa, from Marches Hill and Breakaday Hill, from Chain Bridge and Bummer's Rock, from Mount Rural and Old Town Hill, a terrible distance from home. Time passes, memorials become overgrown. New wars and economic crises engage the interests of the people. So it has always been. It is our hope, however, that these stories we have recorded will serve to keep these memories alive so that they will never truly be forgotten. We would like to end our program with a musical tribute to the 43 men and women who gave their lives to keep our country free. Christ was born.